Hey, I've, I've highlighted just a few sections here. I'm going to skip most of my report and just read over the highlighted sections. So we, this is the second time that, that we have decided we ought to look at Eastern Ribbon State and decide whether or not it's something we should bring forward and, and recommend for any sort of additional protection or listing. We did it in 2012. We decided it wasn't quite worthy of, of bringing forward and recommending. And we're in that process again. We haven't we haven't made a decision on that. Um, and we will in March and we'll let you know whether or not we intend to bring that forward. Are you just looking at it again because of fewer occurrences for your sightings? Or? Well, you know, to, to some of people like me, I, I mean, we kind of had this gut feeling anecdotally that we couldn't find it in places where we used to be able to find it. Mm -hmm. And so then we tried to, then I had uh, Rosie, who was here last time, uh, taking advantage of graduate students, uh, put together kind of a review. And we spent a lot of time on that. She and I went back and forth and back and forth. And um, it definitely is missing from, uh, well, let me put it this way, to be clearer. It has not been reported. Grand Isle, um, Shelburne Pond, where the University of Vermont has specimens back in the day. Uh, also, Camp Johnson, it's definitely people have been to these places and we can't find it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. and, and the question about is just, well, is it at a level where we think it should be recommended? And we're just going back and forth yeah. okay. right now. Yeah. Um, so um, in terms of permits, you know what we've been doing there. It's come through Lamberside permits, Fowler's Toe, Green Mountain Power. We did um, one of the things we brought up before is we decided to review the species of special concern, um, which, as you know, is a label that that we put on that doesn't have any legal status at all. It's just kind of a watch list. And so um, we had two people, Brittany Mosher and, and Aaron Talmadge, who volunteered to put together a risk matrix, which you have a copy of and you can look at online. Um, and so to really evaluate species of special concern, and, and it actually generates numbers, um, you know, and we used a ranking of, of all these different categories of one to five, whether or not that's actually the best ranking, whether some of them should be one to 10 and others should be one to five and one to four, whatever. We just used one to five on all of them, generated numbers, and then looked at the relative numbers. And then gathered all the data we could, and, and what we decided was that um, northern leopard frog, mink frog, and smooth green snake should have a special concern status on it. And of those, I think only northern leopard frog would be one that would raise some people's eyebrows because it can be tremendously abundant vocally mm -hmm. in certain places. It could just, yeah, hugely abundant, but it's really localized and it's disappeared from <clears throat> most of its Connecticut River populations and central Vermont mm -hmm. populations. So while it still seems to be doing fine in many places in uh, Champlain Valley, um, it's a three habitat species and it's kind of tricky because it needs permanent water to overwinter in. And often that's either Lake Champlain or its major tributaries. It then needs flood water in which to lay its eggs. And I think that may be some of the reason why we don't see it on the Connecticut River where it once was, because we control those floods, you know, and we don't have that flooding. And, and thirdly, it needs early successional habitat that it feeds it. In that early successional habitat, much of it we keep open with machinery. Um, some of it we don't, uh, sedge, swamps, uh, cattails, that kind of stuff. So, um, the mink frog, it's a northern species. It, it's from primarily in Canada and it reaches down into Vermont. And it's kind of the obvious uh, global warming concern species. It's a cold water breeder. It needs cold water. It needs cold water to deliver the oxygen to its egg masses. It, it, it lays a globular egg mass, which has evolved with cold water in order to get oxygen to the center of the egg mass. If you're going to breed warm water, you lay a film so that you can get the oxygen you need. And so that's a concern for us. It has disappeared from some of its historic sites. 
it doesn't mean that there has been an adequate effort in all those sites to relocate the species. Not the case. It's just that some of them we don't have records from the last 25 years, you know, and we haven't visited all those sites. Blue green snake. Um, this poor guy, again, early success, success, successional habitat, you know, and um, if somebody is creating that early successional habitat by taking hay off the land, they're not going to be there. That's getting equipment on that piece of property too often. If somebody is brush hogging for a view once a year, that could be a fine piece of habitat. And as ugly as they are, power lines are a fine piece of habitat for these guys. Some cases, there's other areas that are kept open for various reasons. And once again, dead swamps, some wetlands, they're open anyhow. Parking lots for sugar on snow. There you go. <laughs> no, I wouldn't think that's what it is. Well, the fields across from my house. <laughs> okay. All right. Gosh, I'll I'll okay. Two years, but periodic. Periodic. periodic and we make sure there's yeah. parking for sugar on snow. Um, and then uh, the other change was the common map turtle, which um, Steve Barron, a number of years ago, um, mentioned, they said, geez, I'm seeing these all over the place. Why is this special concern? And that's really one of the reasons that we did this reevaluation to begin with. And so we did look at it, and, and the common map was very, very restricted in its, in, in its distribution. It's just like Champlain, and um, the bottoms of the tributaries up to the first barrier. But we have no, although it's limited in distribution, it seems to be doing fine. The numbers of that, uh, you, you sometimes see incredibly large numbers that uh, in some areas. And recently, we've discovered Sunset Lake and Hortonia also have that species, map turtle. We're not entirely sure why, whether this is something humans brought about or whether this had something to do with Holtony River drainage and somehow they established themselves. So we're recommending that common map turtle no longer have special concern status. We're still playing around with that matrix and there may be some other species that we mention in the future. Um, and there's more details in the document. Special concerns, that's not a direct correlation with like the S3 or something like that. No, it doesn't necessarily line up with a uh, state rank. I mean, intuitively it might seem like it should. Yeah, <laughs> well, sure. I mean, we don't, we don't use that plants. You just, yeah. Oh, you don't use special concern at all? No, we use uncommon. That's a blanket applied to S3 species. I think. Yeah. Okay. Very rare for us. Okay. Well, well, for us, it's just raising a flag on these things that we ought to be watching these. Yep. Yeah. So essentially, how do you use S3? Okay. Um, just kind of a quick update on, on Mark Ferguson's work, which was, you might remember that um, out of our concern of, of the results of lamprosite treatment on mud puppy populations, we at one point recommended that we move some mud puppies upstream of the treatment areas that we treated with lamprosite. So we could establish some populations above those areas that were treated. And the primate, the best piece of habitat that we're aware of is the Lomono River for mud puppies. And so that's where that effort started, moving mud puppies above the treatment area in the Lomono River. And um, he's got transmitters on some of them. Uh, eight out of 12 mud puppies carrying transmitters are still alive after having been moved. Uh, it's just above Arrowhead Lake. A total of 134 mud puppies were captured and moved. That's pretty impressive, really, um, that he caught and was able to move that. And, and frankly, that's good news that there were that many that he could find mm -hmm. in the Lamoille River that are still surviving. Mm -hmm. So that's good news all the way around. Um, with recent lamprosite treatments, we have long been concerned that, that the Lewis Creek population was, was either 
extirpated or lowered to levels that just pretty much made them undetectable. Um, and to the credit of Fish and Wildlife, um, they have organized these mud puppy rescue nights when lentricides are used. And a bunch of us get out at night, canoes and flashlights, and we scoop up any mud puppies that appear to be stunned and put them in fresh water. And hopefully they make it through the night. And they have. Um, but we didn't find any in Little Creek. Now, to give you some background there, there were never a lot in Lewis Creek. It was not a strong population to begin with, but we haven't found any Lewis Creek mud puppies for quite a few years now. Um, the other treated river was the Pulteney River, and we did find some mud puppies um, in the Pulteney River. And um, let's see, Luke Groff reported that 15 dead mud puppies were collected in their nine sampling areas along the Pulteney River. Um, Keep in mind when you hear these numbers, these are samples, and it's roughly 20% of the river that's sampled non target mortalities. It's not just for mud puppies, it's for some fish species. And I don't really remember what's going on in terms of uh, mussels, et cetera, in terms of surveys that take place after the fact. I'm not sure they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very hard to survey. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a little bit about pond slider in that um, pond slider is the most popular pet turtle. Uh, and, and you can keep it in the aquaria. It's not, you know, it's aquatic, uh, but they live longer than your kids do. And so when your kids go off to college or whatever, pond sliders get released. And they've shown up, and we're going to start this year. We're updating our maps in the atlas, and we're going to start mapping pond slider for the first time. Now, we're not suggesting that they're breeding at these sites necessarily, but we know they're there, and we know they've tried to breed because they have tried to lay eggs. And it's a it's a real invasive problem in states south of us. Um, well, I mean, in countries all around the world, it's a it's a problem. Um, and we are we fear that with climate change and warmer summers and warmer nesting time periods that this species might well breed here and become invasive. And so um, we have suggested that that be addressed and you guys are starting to work on that. Yeah, it's, it gets complicated because if you just ban them uh, and make them illegal, everybody will release their pets. Yeah, yeah. And then. So uh, if we don't want that, there's a grand. There needs to be a grandparent clause, and um, and also it it has to involve the pet. You know the the pet stores, at yeah. least the mortar and brick ones. The online ones are hard to control. Yeah, we realize. Do you know? Yeah, there's lots of issues there. It is on the international top 100 list of worst places. Yeah, it's nasty. in some states um they actually collected them and they were overwhelmed they, yeah, yeah with all the sliders that came in yeah and so we came up with some maybe far out suggestions, you know, <laughs> ship them all back to the pond slider readers and, uh, you know, take a truck, of, take a truck back to South Carolina and say, here, put them out somewhere else. COD. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and maybe you could establish a relationship like that. Um, truck them to some lake that's within their natural range, but get them out of the state essentially is some of the suggestions we've had. Now there are other concerns that you would have about disease, whether you might actually be once they've been in the pet trade, they've picked up some disease from other imported species that might end up. So there are certainly other concerns. It's a tricky sort of a situation, but it's one that we're concerned. Is it hard to um, determine if, if they're um, reproducing? Well, a better idea. all we're going on right now is that 
we have not ever seen a young one. We've only seen adults. And, you know, it takes them a few years to grow up. So, yeah. so we're going. Yeah. Stephanie had a, yeah. 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 Um, I was just thinking in terms of online trade and being able to limit that, the agency of Ag has had some success in yeah. regulating online trade. Well, just that we we do online market looking and yeah. then we contact the person who's selling and we say we have a law against ABC and you need to put something on your website that says these cannot be sold in the state of Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. So we do that. Uh, you know, from a noxious weed standpoint, we do that for um, pesticide dealers that do online sales. We say, you're not a pesticide dealer with our state, so you need to say that you don't sell to the state of Vermont. Um, but it, it requires enforcement and investment and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, in yeah. doing that market work and, and personnel and resources. So that's great. But yeah, we, we contract with you. No, we added a 20 or 30 species. To your <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Be a bunch of um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that it's perfect. Like we're not like sometimes we miss people or you know dealers that are working wherever. But um, we we do some online inspections to, to make sure people are following our, our rules in our state. Yeah. Well, that's useful to know. And she's taking yeah. notes, so maybe when we get to that point, uh, yeah. we're not there yet. Yeah, and we have contacts with Amazon and. Have SC2, so like we could say, you need to work with whoever's on your website to ensure that they that they abide by our laws. That, that's that is really great. We've gone and gotten nowhere with Amazon. Mm -hmm. There are also, and I take this opportunity to say that there are, there are already turtles that do get sold within the state that are either listed or um, oh, yeah. let me see. Listed or at least protected. And you know, like, what, what can we say about wood turtle? Uh, should be protected. Well, they're native species. You can't have a wildlife, Vermont wildlife. Yeah. Right? Okay. So we we'll get there different. that way. But yeah, I mean, I yes, yeah, in five minutes I could order fifty spotted turtles and have you could them before yeah. the end of the meeting. And and wardens have had had stings or at least actions that have followed up and. Um, taken possession of spotted turtles um, and wood turtles. There was a period of time uh, wood turtles were people were claiming they were Ohio wood turtles. And then to their credit, Ohio made it illegal to own Ohio wood turtles, even though Ohio didn't have wood turtles. <laughs> <laughs> so I closed, I closed one loophole. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, maybe two minutes, Jim. All right. Wrap up. Um, so we've already mentioned the herb protection concerns. Um, so I think I'll skip that. You guys are working on that. Um, I, I do want to say once again that there's there two species. Uh, well, one boreal coarse frog probably extirpated from the state. We haven't heard about that species. No record since 1999. It's frustrating. We would love to know why that species disappeared, but we do not. It's a lowland species, um, northwestern corner of Vermont. It was always peripheral, but haven't seen it. And what's kind of approaching that is North American racers, where we haven't had a record now since 2015. And that is also a peripheral species in the southeastern corner. Uh, so those are two species that we're particularly concerned about. Now it was Mark Ferguson, those fish and wildlife who was keeping track of those, the boreal chorus frogs, and he's the one that actually saw the, the last one. Um, there was an effort in Quebec uh, to look into reintroduction. Looks like that fizzled out. Um, I think part of the problem is we don't know why they disappeared in the first place. And if we don't know why they disappeared, then putting them back in that habitat would not necessarily be successful. Uh, we found a new location for rat snakes and it was on, or at least near state land, Almondville Wildlife Management Area. It was a real surprise that we were down there looking around and sadly we found it dead on the road, Route 7, but it was exciting anyhow. Moving forward with the uh, 
timber rattlesnake wildlife underpasses on Route 22A, which will be um, which is very exciting. And so that's going to happen. It's just a question of exact locations and, and specifics of design. And we're doing that in cooperation with Fish and Wildlife VTrans and McFarland Johnson is the contractor that's working with them. And can I add a note? Yep. Sub note to that is that we're also being careful about not advertising those exact mm -hmm. locations. And we're also kind of being careful about not calling them timber rattlesnake underpasses. Yes. Wildlife. Yes. Yes. Otter underpass. Cute and slurry. <laughs> um, let's see. Spotted turtle trapping was not successful. We're trying to find new populations of spotted turtles. Had some folks working with that this year. And the beaches, because of the flooding early, the beaches for nesting for spiny soft shell were flooded and uh, was not a successful year for spiny soft shell. However, some sites were successful and other while others were not, which is a good example of why you need multiple locations okay. for species. And that will be in our newsletter. <laughs> um, and, and are both of those sites listed as critical? Well, there's four of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not all of the nesting sites were listed as critical. Right, that, but those that were, one, yeah, yeah, okay, I was just wondering, yeah. yeah. Um, the matrix, I wasn't really planning on talking about it now. I right. could talk about it sometime, but it's available online for anybody to look at um, how that works and please borrow it or prove it. Yeah, I'll just say so. Uh, I put this in the uh, in the chat that it's in um, 2024 meeting materials. Yeah, I th I think it's worth looking at. Um, I mean, sort of in you know two ways. One, relevance to other taxa, um, especially in terms of assessing um, special concern. Perhaps not relevant for flora. And then uh, the other one, I think, is also, you know, one of the things that's going to come up with uh, the new wildlife action plan always is the threat piece. And so that is your matrix is really aligned towards threat. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 A weird question. So we're um, within the agency looking at noxious weeds and we're using we're potentially creating a list of noxious weeds that are of special concern or a watch list. It's been commonly known as watch list. And I've heard both those terms used today, mm -hmm. but in a positive context. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether or not we should establish which one which based because we're using it in a negative context. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to and I can talk to other, you know, it does not be a conversation here, but is there does, does this group feel that is a concern? <laughs> it's a special concern. <laughs> <laughs> Because it could be confusing, yeah. and and uh, yeah. My initial reaction was that, I'm like, are are these? Yeah, are they threatened in some? Similar? No, no, yeah, we're right. talking about yeah. noxious yeah. weeds. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. never occurred to me. Yeah. yeah, and I just and it and all, we, we we were we were um we chose special concern because other states have used that term as well for in terms of noxious weeds, and so we were thinking all consistency or I don't know what. Um. <laughs> anyway. Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting because in, in some ways they are sort of the same. I mean, it's a special concern because it's a threat to habitat. Ours are special concern because they're, you know, threatened with becoming threatened or endangered. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right now, I just yeah. was thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There'll be whale species. Watch list. Yeah. Like watch yeah. List. yeah. For not yeah. to be. I've heard that a lot. For what it's worth. Yeah. Uncommon. Okay. Yeah. That that's that's really clear. Watch list or special concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, and, to get into the fine bits of databasing, so the S ranks don't have like or the, the state rankings and the global ranks don't have the special concern. That's not where that's housed. It's generally housed at state and federal level for with endangered species listing. Yeah. So it's either threatened, endangered, or special concern. So you yeah. could have S rank, S whatever, three, and a special concern. Mm -hmm. They're sure. 
a different a different way of, of slicing and dicing. It, it, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to say in in at least in the parlance that using we don't yeah. special concern for plants being as uncommon. But uh, there's there's plenty plant. of other terms for describing the plants. Yes, we are are doing doing rich. rich. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brian, why don't you go ahead? Cool. Yeah, so you make two quick questions. One, uh, Jim, on the on the risk matrix, I think I noticed that you didn't weight any of those various threats in any way. And if you might consider that, I would think that considering Vermont's share of a species, either national or a global population, might be an appropriate way. Uh, one thing that one way you might want to weight threats, and I don't know if we if we have a disproportionate or a, or a significantly proportionate share of any of those species, and whether it may change the relative rankings in terms of threats. Yeah, I've heard that referred to as responsibility species before. Yeah. Uh, what percentage uh, things like wood turtle? We have the best habitat for wood, some of the best habitat for wood turtle and its northeastern species. And, and, and when you look at something like northern leopard frog, I guess we have inherited some of that responsibility because it's disappeared from much of its Midwestern pop, uh, habitat. It disappeared from there. So in that sense, even though we, you can wander in West Haven and worry about stepping on them, you know, every step yeah. you take, um, Right now, it, they, the commercial market for leopard frogs shifted to Vermont from the Midwest because of the decline in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet, I don't know, is there, are they, you still getting permit requests for leopard frogs? Um, no, not that not, stopped. Not, that stopped. Uh, yeah. The, the, one, the one company that was, they used to collect like 50,000 a year, they, they aged out. Um, yeah. and, and actually, the, the the lack of demand is what happened. It, yeah. Fifteen years ago, they were collecting fifty thousand a year, and but now that schools don't do, you know, dissection thing, dissection, tax life entities anymore, it just dropped, and, and the guy retired. Yeah. And, and, and so maybe we get a request from twenty. I guess I just throw out there. I don't think the threat was the loss of individuals ever. Yeah. It's the loss of, of contiguous habitat that's appropriate of three types. Yeah, yeah, I was surprised to see them. I was surprised to see them in a, that high in your risk matrix, given that I, yeah. I've actually, you know, we many of us have stepped and had many of them literally yeah. hop away, like zillions of them as you step. Um, yeah, but the question is, how many places in Vermont can you do that? Yeah, I've done it in West Haven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the other really quick question is on mink frog decline. I don't know whether you've noticed or whether you're able to tell whether in some of the like undisturbed northern ponds or, or wetlands, peatlands, for example, um, or maybe not peatlands, whether you're seeing declines in those those habitats where there don't seem to be other any apparent um, impacts to the quality of that habitat other than maybe climate, you know, or whether they're disappearing from their the southern edges of their range. Or well, declining. I wish we could really answer that question based on having sent people out specifically to to monitor mink frogs in those populations. Uh, and we haven't. And okay. We can't. I mean, we just don't have. We don't have the people to do that regularly. Perhaps we should, but we don't. But um, one surprise to us was that we discovered a population, or was reported to us in Moncton, and that's the southeastern corner, southwestern corner of their range. And all of a sudden, we dis discovered this population that. Nobody had ever known about. Um, could be groundwater source that controls the temperature of the water, keeps it cooler. I don't know why. 
that population is still hanging in there than you have us having. But I guess uh, the honest answer to your question is no, we don't have that kind of data that shows they have been here for years and we're still looking and we're still getting the data and they're still there. It's more hit and miss our data. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I I don't think it doesn't look like Bill is on and I did not get any uh, I did not get a report from him. Kent, are you are you good to go before lunch? Do the invert report. Absolutely, I can do that. No problem. Anybody know how Bill is doing? All right. Floor is yours. All right, I'll do it um, quickly. Maybe catch us up because probably people are anxious to go to lunch. But um, I don't. I have not given you a paper copy yet, so it's not on the screen. So I'm just going to give you an overview, and then if you're fascinated by invertebrates and who that isn't, you can go and read the report later. Um, but for 2023, we've got 14 members on our SAG now, um, which has doubled our membership, I think, in the last decade. And honestly, I'd love to double it again because there's so many invertebrates and we need so many experts to be able to speak about invertebrates that I'm continually looking and trying to add people onto the um, invertebrate SAG group from all walks of life. So. But it's been nice to add, add so many members and have so much expertise now from all walks of life across Vermont and beyond from, I think, most of the agencies and departments are represented even. So it's just and even folks that have recently retired are sticking on the SAG and helping us um, continuing on. So that's that's really been great. Um, and if you hear of any other expertise, anyone in, in the room, I we're always happy to hear about it and add more people onto our SAG. Um, I like to give a quick box score always for the invertebrate group because um, we're jealous of the other group that have fewer species. So we have 18 invertebrates listed right now, one amphipod, 10 freshwater mussels, which are clearly the group that is hurting the most, um, three tiger beetles and four bumblebees, which came up earlier. Um, but I always like to remind everybody that we think there's about 21,000 invertebrate species in Vermont. So we have a ways to go to understanding invertebrates here. Um, some of the groups, we don't even have a checklist of, of what occurs in Vermont, but, and this is the first time I think I've ever put this in the box score in the last decade, we really are making progress. We've done, a, we, the greater we, like everybody in that room and in, out in, in the, the greater meeting room and our, our SAG and everyone has done great progress and work on invertebrates. We've learned a ton in the last decade or more um, about invertebrates. So. Um, we didn't do any listing actions or reviews this year. We still have some ongoing study and reports that we're working on. Um, one that you're going to see this year for sure, and it could even be your next meeting. I could, but I'll happy to schedule it with you, Alan, whenever, which is going to be um, elk toe, uh, freshwater mussel that we've been working on for a while. Um, we're drafting the report right now, and we're, we're, we're going to ship it to you this year for sure. And actually any date you want to at your pleasure um, to be considered for listing. Uh, this is a mussel that only exists in maybe a five mile stretch of the Lamoille River. Um, and it's an S1 and we've got a lot more data for it now over the last bunch of years. So we're moving ahead with the Elkto. Um, and then the other uh, species that we're working on status reports on just in draft form and you may not even ever see them. Um, we really got to get the data together and decide if we're going to push them forward right now, which would be, um, there's three lady beetle species that we've been um, looking at closely. Um, they're listed in Canada. Some of these are listed in Canada already federally and surround some of the surrounding states, especially New York, have them as species of greatest conservation need. And maybe one of them actually is ranked in New York too. Um, these are these three species, the two spot lady beetle, the nine spot lady beetle and the transverse lady beetle. The three of them used to be quite common in Vermont and actually in the entire region. And they disappeared mostly in the 1990s. Um, but fortunately, we just finished up a four or five year um, lady beetle project. And we actually rediscovered uh, the two spot lady beetle in Vermont. We have now two populations we rediscovered after 30 years. 
Um, and can't, and in New York, they rediscovered the nine spotted lady beetle in two populations. So there's some hope for these formerly common lady beetle species that they, we could actually do something about them or maybe bring them back or at least keep them on the landscape. Um, and so we've digitized all the historic data from all the collections, over 4,000 records. And we went out and collected another six or 7,000 lady beetle records um, in the last couple of years. And so we're putting all that together and deciding um, if any of these would warrant bringing forward to the Endangered Species Committee. Um, and then we're working on some critical habitat designations. Uh, Brook floater um, on the West River is in progress. Um, and we're working on, we're still working on and mulling over um, critical habitat designation for the Taconic Cave amphipod our one amphipod, which is uh, in a cave down in uh, Mount Tabor. So mostly the threats to that are, head, they're, it's, it's groundwater pollution and maybe anthropogenic disturbances outside the cave would be the problem for this, anthro for this amphipod. And it's just sort of a head scratcher because there's a lot of landowners above the cave system that would be feeding into this groundwater system for the cave. So it's a bit of a, difficult situation on that one. We're still looking into it and figuring out who all the landowners are and, and if we could even proceed with some of this designation. Um, and then there's some recovery plans that are still in the works. There's recovery plans for tiger beetles, the hairy neck tiger beetle, the cobblestone tiger beetle are still in progress. And we recently formed a subcommittee for ISAG to look at the freshwater mussel situation and whether we can move forward with some recovery plans for those and some other conservation action items that we might try to tackle with some of these freshwater mussels. Um, so we have a, a small committee that just formed that you'll probably hear about in our next uh, 2024 report because it just formed and we're trying to move forward with some of that conservation work. Um, and then we've done a lot of work, uh, as I mentioned, on just trying to get enough data to give S ranks to a lot of species groups um, like lady beetles, which I um, mentioned, but we have a lot of moth work we've been doing. So we're able to do a lot more work with moths. Orthoptera, we've digitized all the historic and current data for a lot of Orthoptera species. And, and the list goes on for a bunch of groups that we've done a ton of work to get data for, actual occurrence data for. And so we're gonna be moving ahead to try to um, give S ranks to some of those groups um, probably this year. and. Alongside that, we're working pretty closely with um, the department on the 2025 State Wildlife Action Plan and trying to figure out which species might be species of greatest conservation need, which some of those species maybe we can remove potentially. And then also, you know, what, what are some of these habitats that we would be most interested in for these species of greatest conservation need? And how can wrap up habitat into the plan too? So we're working closely with Roz and and John and others um, and Mark Ferguson and try to figure out how we can uh, help with that um, work also, which is daunting. And then there's, we just have a list of some, some highlights from some of the work that ISAG members are doing that have really helped out, um, that they've been doing in their own work that have helped out the SAG. And one of them is, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, is digitizing historic data. Um, it's been really huge for us to digitize these collections at UVM and other places. And Savannah, who you heard from earlier, um, for the fungi SAG, is puts on her other hat and is on our SAG too. And her and her lab have done a really great job on digitizing the Vermont Forest Biology Lab's insect collection. Um, and they continue to um, ramp up digitization of that. We get to see a lot more records of things that we didn't Sometimes we didn't even know we had in the state because they were just in the collections. And those are going uh, into digitizing right into, into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So we got quick, quick, quickly can you put that stuff into action? Um, and that's happening with a lot of other collections in the state too, which is, like I said, really helping our SAG understand where current records are coming from. Um, and then a couple other projects I'll just mention really quickly. Um, that's also helping. We have a uh, iNaturalist project that hit a million records for Vermont this past year. Um, it has, uh, we've crossed a million record threshold from community scientists across Vermont, which, so something like 25,000 Vermonters have put data in there over the last decade. And last year, half of that data were invertebrates, which is 
is amazing. It's like our number one source of data right now is coming through there. Uh, many first state records, uh, many uh, species that we didn't know where they that they existed in some of these different biophysical regions. So it's really it's an amazing collection of data that's going on there. A lot of really great bee records, for example. And then with uh, and in partnership with uh, the department, we started the second Vermont Butterfly Atlas, which I think is probably the first time we've ever, we're gonna ever have a comparative um, atlas of, of an insect species. So we did the first butterfly atlas back in 2002 to 2007. 20 years later, we're repeating that butterfly atlas. I can tell you that there's been drastic changes in the butterfly fauna over the 20 years. It's pretty amazing. Um, but I will put, uh, tip my hat to Brian Pfeiffer, who's on our SAG and on the ESC committee, who after 20 years of Brian and I pounding and others pounding around bogs across the state, Brian found our first population of bog elephants, which is um, sort of scattered across the Northeast and is, an, is a uh, conservation concern species. We finally found a population in Vermont. There's probably more. So that was our first exciting discovery for the butterfly atlas. It's an S1 species um, in a bog in Vermont. And probably if you pay Brian enough money, he'd probably take you to see it, but you'd probably have to pay him quite a bit of money though. Uh, Good fundraiser. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of other great projects going on with freshwater mussels from our ISAG members and groups. So if you're interested in any of those projects, always um, please reach reach out to us if you have any need any information about invertebrates. We've got a great, like I said, we've got a great group, a lot, a lot of experts on our group. So that's some of the highlights. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, or we can just go to lunch. Thank you, Kent. Kent, one thing I'll say, because I, I don't think you were, I, I want to say you weren't at the last SAG meeting. Um, and I don't know how de in detail you read the minutes. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, Mike. We've we've had some conversations about um, potential funding availability through the Champlain Basin program for some muscle surveys, and it it really does sound like they would um, really love to see a proposal um, in collecting some more baseline muscle data. And I think those um, RFPs come out in the fall, so um, keep an eye on that and um, kind of push it out to your um to the folks who have really been thinking about muscle work on your on your sag because i think you right. could get some money for that work excellent yeah I'm, i think michael Lou smith on our group has tapped into that a little bit but that's exciting okay. to know that we could go maybe bigger that would be great yeah yeah questions for uh for ken or comments when are you gonna do land snails? <laughs> it's funny you should say that, Roz, because Mark Ferguson and I were just talking about it last week, and we have I've gathered all the data known for land snails in Vermont, and I'm working on digitizing it all right now. And there's actually a surprising amount of data for land snails. So, yeah. Wow. Have you seen the report from Carnegie? Uh, oh yeah. Or yeah. The, or I, yeah. The regional... Okay. I know it's not as good as what you do, but there's a there's a whole land snail website too that yeah. the feds is that the same one you're talking about yeah we have all that for sure thanks but if you run into anybody that has personal collections that we don't know about or something like that like there's always there's always hidden stuff out there for sure Okay, well, thanks, Kent. Well, why don't we break for lunch? Uh, what do we, we've got, uh, we're significantly behind schedule. We've got <laughs> birds, flora, fish, hermits. So, uh, well, you know, who who does not follow the time limits for the snags? <laughs> Orioles <laughs> and the mink flog with a globular egg mass. <laughs> Needing cold hey, water to get oxygen <laughs> permutation into the center of the mass. <laughs> hey Roz, for your hey Roz, for your suggestion of my guiding people to bog elephants as a fundraiser, I'll do it if we can use the money to fund a sta another state botanist position. 
<laughs> that sounds awesome. I guess you've got a lot, a big fan base then, huh? <laughs> yeah, hey, talk to my publicist. <laughs> I, and the other thing is I'm sitting here on Main Street in Montpelier. I just had an adult bald eagle fly past my window. So thanks, <laughs> Alan and Mark. <laughs> you bird it. <laughs> yeah, I will. I think, well, I think I heard the results. There were like 60 plus that we're seeing with oh, yeah. the winter count this year. I don't know, Mark, if you've been in the loop on this recently, but we're feeding loons to eagles now. Yeah, yeah a, I was gonna. I, I thought this might be an interesting lunch discussion. Yeah. Actually, speaking of feeding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So why don't we? Uh, I think I I put a half an hour in. Um, if we can do it, if we can take lunch quicker than that, great. Um, but let's uh, let's be back here no longer than no later than twelve forty. All right, I'll see you at 1245 then. Yeah.